Practice Listening Test 3 Turn to Section 1 of Practice Listening Test 3. Section 1 You have just arrived at the student hostel where you will live during the term. The manager is explaining the rules and another student is asking questions. Listen to the conversation and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5 on the Student Hostel Charges for Meals form. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. The conversation relating to this will be played first. Excuse me, I want to ask you about the charges for meals. Are they the same as they were last year? No, I'm afraid they're not. We've managed to keep most of them the same, but we've had to increase the charge for breakfast. How much is it now? It's $2.50. It used to be $2.00. I see. What about lunch? It's unchanged. Still $3. Breakfast costs $2.50, so the change has been written in. Lunch still costs $3, so the information has been ticked. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Excuse me, I want to ask you about the charges for meals. Are they the same as they were last year? No, I'm afraid they're not. We've managed to keep most of them the same, but we've had to increase the charge for breakfast. How much is it now? It's $2.50. It used to be $2. I see. What about lunch? It's unchanged. Still $3. Does dinner still cost $3? Yes, it does. We've managed to keep the prices down this year, but the best deal is the three-meal plan for $48 per week. We give you vouchers to present when you come into the cafeteria, and you get 21 meals for your $48. That works out to a little more than $2 a meal. The two-meal plan is also at last year's rates of $36 per week. We give you vouchers for that too. My sister was in this hostel before me. I'm sure the hours for breakfast used to be longer. Yes, they were. They used to be 7 to 9.30. But to keep our expenses down, we made them 7 to 9. Lunch is the way it was, though. Hold on. Dinner, 6 to 7.30. Isn't that a change? Yes, it is. And in fact, the form is wrong. It used to be 5.30 to 7.30, but now it's 6 to 8 p.m. 6 to 8 p.m. That's good. So, which plan would you like? I'd like to think about it, please. I need to check my lecture schedule. Now look at questions 6 to 8. Listen to the conversation between the student and the manager and match the places in questions 6 to 8 to the appropriate letters A to F on the map. Can you tell me how to get to my room, please? Of course. You're in the new wing, which is very freshly painted and pleasant. But I'm afraid you're going to have to go to a couple of other offices before you can have the key. You're in the admissions office now. Leave this office and turn right and go to the end of the hall. The last office is the fees office, where you can pay the balance of your room deposit. They'll give you a receipt. OK. After you've been to the fees office, come back past admissions. You'll see a very large room at the northwestern corner of the building. You can't miss it. That's the student lounge, and if you go in there, you can meet some of the other students and see who'll have a room near you. That's good. Can I get a cup of coffee there? Yes, there's a vending machine in the corner. 
Then go to the key room, which is opposite the lift and next to the library. Show them your receipt, and you can pick up your key there. My luggage was sent on ahead. Do you know where I should collect it? The box room is next to the women's toilet. You'll have to get the key from the key room. Thank you. That is the end of section one. You will now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a teacher helping high school students visiting from an overseas school to fill in a school excursion permission note. First, look at questions nine to sixteen. Listen while a teacher tells you how to complete the school excursion permission note. Write no more than three words or numbers for each answer. Good morning, students. My name is Mrs. Brown, and I'm in charge of the school excursion next week. Please take out your school excursion permission note so you can fill it in. For insurance purposes, this note must be signed by your guardian or the group leader. First of all, fill in the name of your class. Everyone here is in three A, aren't they? So write three A where it says class. We're going to the Blue Mountains, which is great. So this is the school excursion to the Blue Mountains. The day we leave is Monday. That's Monday, June ten. We are travelling by bus all the way. So we don't have to worry about changing trains or anything like that. The bus will leave from the front gate at eight a.m. I know we usually use the side gate, but because of the roadworks, we will be using the front gate when we leave. However, when we return, the roadwork will be complete, so we'll use the side gate. We expect to be back at six p.m. It's going to be a lovely day. Your teachers will give you tasks to do when we arrive. We'll provide fruit and fruit juice on the bus, but you must bring your own lunch. While we're on the excursion, we'll be moving around a lot in some fairly rough country. Be very careful to wear strong shoes. It's very important that you look after your feet very well. Now, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Now look at questions seventeen to nineteen. As the talk continues, answer questions seventeen to nineteen. Write no more than three words or numbers for each answer. No questions. Okay. I'd just like to fill in a few more details. The bus should arrive in the Blue Mountains at 11 a.m. We'll have time to do the first of our tasks before lunch. The bus is not a new one, but it does carry one piece of special equipment—a first aid kit. I certainly hope we won't have to use it, but it's nice to know it's there in case we have a medical emergency. The other class on this excursion is 3B. So I know it'll be a good day. The last time 3A and 3B went out together was a thoroughly successful excursion. That is the end of section two. You will now have some time to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In this section, you will hear a conversation between Mrs. Lamb, a member of the staff in a large hospital, and Andrew, who is a student in the nursing school. Mrs. Lamb is explaining the rules about visiting hours in the hospital. Look at questions 20 to 25. Listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 20 to 22. Complete the table showing when visitors may go to the different parts of the hospital. Hello, Andrew. I believe you want to know about visiting hours. Yes, I do, Mrs Lamb. I have to fill this form out and I'd like to have some idea why the different parts of the hospital have different times for visiting. I see. Well, let's start with an obvious one. Intensive care. People in intensive care are very sick indeed, and for that reason we say that visitors can come between 6 a.m. and midnight. I can understand that. At the other end of the scale, our maternity patients are usually quite well, but we restrict their visiting hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We find they get very tired if we permit visitors all the time. I see. What about the surgical wards? The doctors prefer to do their rounds early in surgical, so visiting hours are 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Surgical patients are often on very heavy painkillers, and they aren't really very good company for their visitors. But surely the visitors come to cheer up the patient, not the other way around. Of course, and often the visitors are able to help the patient a lot. That's why we allow visitors all day, the full 24 hours in the emergency ward, they help comfort the patient while they're waiting to be diagnosed. In the second part of the discussion, Andrew will ask Mrs Lamb about the people who are allowed to visit patients. Look at questions 23 to 25 first. Complete the table showing who is allowed to visit and the number of visitors permitted. Use the letter A to show that adults may visit, E to show that everyone may visit, and I to show that only immediate family may visit. Of course, it's not just everyone who can visit a sick patient. People in intensive care can only be visited by their immediate family. What's more, we only allow two people in at any time. We let children of the immediate family in to visit people in intensive care, but we don't like to do it. It's very hard on the children, and it may distress the patient. However, if the patient asks for the child, and the family agrees, that's OK. What about children in maternity? Of course we let them in. They're very pleased to see their mothers. The rule in maternity is everyone may visit, up to six people at a time. The maternity ward is quite sociable after all. The surgical ward must be different. It is indeed. We don't allow children in the surgical ward because of the danger of infection. And as you know, we restrict the hours. There are a lot of procedures which must be carried out on surgical patients and we only let two visitors come in at a time. And in emergency, people are allowed to visit all the time? Oh, yes. We rely on patients' relatives to be there for them. And we permit everyone to visit the emergency department at all hours. However, we restrict it to three visitors for each patient. Otherwise, the room just gets totally crowded. Now listen to Mrs Lamb explaining where Andrew will spend the first week of his training. Circle two letters. An example has been done for you. Look at questions 26 and 27.
Circle two letters in each answer. Now I have your schedule for the next week's observation sessions. Are you ready? Yes. Where do I start? On Monday, you'll be in male surgical in the morning, and in female surgical in the afternoon. You'll be following Dr. Shea on her rounds. Thank you. And on Tuesday? On Tuesday, you'll be with Dr. Thomas in the morning and Dr. Robertson in the afternoon. No, that can't be right. You're with Dr. Thomas in the afternoon and Dr. Robertson in the morning. Do I ever get to see Dr. Kim? Yes, you'll be with Dr. Kim on Thursday and Friday. She'll take you through the children's ward and through our new teenage ward for twelve to fifteen-year-olds. Great. I've read a lot about that new ward. Will I see the schoolroom? Maybe another time. Now look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Write no more than three words or numbers for each answer. And what will I do on Wednesday? On Wednesday, you'll join the other students for lectures. You'll be in the Redmore lecture room between eight and ten a.m. and later between two and three p.m. Thank you. Do you know how big my class is? The intake this term is two hundred first-year students. I'm pleased to say about one third are men, which is good. Nursing used to be an almost entirely female occupation. I know. My father trained as a nurse, and he was considered very unusual. Is he still working as a nurse? Yes, he's working in a hospital in the country. I guess I just wanted to follow his example. That is the end of section three. You will now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear an extract from an introductory talk given to a group of students who have just entered a university residential college. The speaker is the principal of the college. Listen to what the speaker says, and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. Good morning, and welcome to Scholastic House. I am delighted to see you here. It is my duty to explain to you some of the history of our college and some of the traditions which I hope you will uphold. The idea for Scholastic House was expounded by Samuel Wells in eighteen ninety-eight. Wells was a visionary whose ideas were well ahead of his time. He wanted a college which would encourage friendship between people of different races and nationalities. Wells died in 1900 before he could see the college in action. Scholastic House finally began operating in 1903 with ten students. Those students came from Asia, Europe, and the Americas. At that time, Scholastic House accepted only male students. Although it has been co-educational since 1963, nine of these foundation students went on to lead illustrious lives. The only exception died tragically on his way home from Scholastic House to Sarawak. He had only recently graduated with an honours degree in law, and he was robbed of a brilliant future. The other nine students, as I said, led very fulfilling lives. Three became political leaders. Three became doctors. Perhaps the most famous graduate became a university teacher, and was responsible for the introduction of modern teaching training methods in his country. 
Two of the original group became senior engineers and went on to deeply influence the way the water systems of their country were exploited. The college ran into hard times during the period of the Great War, 1914 to 1918, when the charter of the college was interpreted to mean that neither students nor staff could take part in the war effort. Many people felt that this indicated a lack of national spirit, and the walls of the college were frequently marked with graffiti. Meantime, outside the college, tens of thousands of young men went away to fight in Europe, never to return. The college was building a reputation for learning and for tolerance of opposing views. Scholastic House debate and discussion nights were open to the public in 1927 and have been available to anyone who wishes to attend ever since. It is a proud tradition of the college that any view may be expressed, provided that it can be defended intellectually. Over the years, topics which were controversial at the time have been discussed and debated. Now look at questions 38 to 40. As I said, the college has a proud history of publicly examining controversial issues. Why should we do this? The publicity we receive is often sensational, and there is no joy in encouraging argument for its own sake. In fact, that sort of discussion just increases tension. The only legitimate reason for our behaviour is that it casts light upon the topic in question and informs the debate. And controversial topics are the ones which most need informed attention. As the world forges ahead, we often find our scientists have outstripped our philosophers. We frequently develop scientific marvels without realising their full implications. Nowhere is this more obvious than in medicine. We are now able to keep people alive far longer than before. But this medical ability must be measured in relation to the quality of those lives. I urge you to spend your time at Scholastic House wisely. You are the heirs of an excellent academic tradition of which we can all be justly proud. It is your responsibility to continue this tradition of querying where our world is going. Progress is not always upwards. I wish you every joy in your time here, and I hope that I will hear much well-informed debate from you. That is the end of Section 4. Now you have some time to check your answers.